Good afternoon. Salaam alaikum. Welcome once again. Good to see so many of you online today. We do appreciate 6 p.m. UK time works better for most of you. However, it's not always possible due to the time difference with various countries and hence the 11 a.m. talks. But there is always a recording of the event to watch later should you miss it. Hope you've had a good three weeks enjoying the various sporting events that are currently on. I have had an eventful week exploring incredible Montenegro. Yes, an opportunity, uh, opportunity came up to attend a work-related event and off I went to this Ambalist country. There isn't a restriction on travel. It's just the testing and quarantine back home criteria and the extra costs for these tests. And of course, important to check with your travel insurers about what they will and won't cover. Home quarantine is no different to what we have experienced in the last few months. Just that there are some wonderful memories to cherish once you're back from a trip. Believe me, that makes it worthwhile. Should you want to know more later, I will be happy to call and talk you through the experience and the procedure. Iran or Persia, where do I even start from? A country so fascinating with a distinctive culture and a history that has been influenced by waves of conquerors in the past. It is a country that has had numerous capitals and royal centers throughout its history. As a result, each region has its own unique um, uniqueness in terms of architecture, food, arts, etc. Contrary to whatever is said in the media, the people are warm, welcoming and friendly, and one feels much safer than here than in many other countries. Those of you who have already traveled to Iran would echo the same sentiments. From Zoroastrian temples, sublime mosques, dramatic fortresses and striking monuments to the Middle East's highest peak, Mount Damawan, the Caspian Sea coast, Aleut Desert, this extraordinary country has it all. One trip is not enough to cover all of its wonders. Most of you would be already familiar with our speaker today. Diana Dark is a Middle East cultural expert who has spent over 30 years living and working in the Middle East. She's the author of several books, including My House in Damascus, which was published in 2016, and the latest Stealing from the Sargents, named Book of the Year 2020. In 2014, she traveled extensively around Iran with Travel the Unknown, noting both the differences and similarities with the Arab world. Earlier this month, she visited the Viennese current Epic Iran exhibition and would recommend it to those who long to travel there. As always, please send any questions through to me via the chat box so that they can be taken up during the question answer round. I won't keep you waiting any longer and hand you over to Dinah now. Over to you, Dinah. Thanks very much, Sunita. And a uh, great pleasure to be talking about Iran. And I should say right from the outset that I do not consider myself an expert on Iran. Um, I'm an Arabic speaker, not a Farsi speaker, and Turkey and, and the Arab world are my specialities. Having said that, obviously I have an interest in Iran uh, and I was lucky enough to have the chance with Travel the Unknown to go there in 2014 and travel around at a time when, um, believe it or not, everything, um, was, was actually, I mean, at that time, it was uh, completely red. I'm showing you now a, the Foreign Office travel advice to give you some sense of how, how the politics uh, affects everything in this country. As Sunita mentioned, it's basically an incredibly safe place to be. There are no wars going on in Iran. Um, there is no internal terrorism. Um, and and yet, because of politics, of course, it um, at the time that that we actually travelled in two thousand and fourteen, um, everything was was coloured red, so you were not to go there. And then, the minute um, diplomatic relations were restored, suddenly overnight, the whole country went went green. <laughs> um, and so, this is how it looked in in two thousand and eighteen. It was all still green at at that point. Um, now, today, this is what it looks like. Um, so uh, it's actually an amber country, most of it, just the red bits are uh, up against the borders there with Afghanistan and with Iraq, um, unless you're a dual national, in which case um, it's, the, the advice is don't go there at all. Obviously, that's because of the case of, um, uh, you know, Nazanin Zavari Radcliffe, um, and they, they do think it's very risky to go there if you're, if you're a dual national. But just as you know, the politics of it 
is just is all in that color scheme basically that's all politics if you're there on the ground there is no difference in terms of how it feels um, safety wise and again for those who haven't been there uh, it's worth stressing how diverse Iran is as a, as a country uh, it has it has high mountains it has forests it has deserts it has lakes um, it, it, it has a huge uh, topographical range that this uh, this map gives you some some flavor of it. Of course, it also has big coastlines um, with the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. And then in terms of the actual uh, de demographics of it, um, it is a huge, uh, hugely um, the Persians do make up the absolutely overwhelming majority there um, with uh, you can see that purple color is 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 Persians, and then Azeris are those uh, the turquoise coloring, and then very small numbers of Kurds. Um, well, about about ten percent actually, not not so small. Um, but it, and then then much smaller groups like um, Baluch and Turkmens, uh, and and a, a small number of Arabs as well, right down in the south there in the green color. And then as far as religion is concerned, it is ninety eight percent. Muslim. Only 2% is, is non-Muslim, and of that 98%, 90% are Shia Muslims. Um, um, and the Shia Muslims, of course, are in the huge minority across the globe. Um, you know, it, it's uh, um, overwhelmingly the, the population of Muslims um, is, um, is Sunni Muslim, so that the, the Shia are only about 10% um, of the Muslims worldwide, but most of them are concentrated in in Iran. So um, I'm going to run you through some pictures that I took myself on the trip um, back in 2014. It was actually September. It was very, very hot. Uh, in fact, at the moment, Iran is in the grip of a heat wave too. Um, massive climate change, I think, is going on, a desiccation of the landscapes and um, uh, you know, low river levels and things. It's afflicting uh, a lot of the Middle East, like, like so many other parts of the world. So, so these pictures are ones that I took myself. I'm just going to run you quickly through to give you a sort of flavor really of, of what I experienced in the country and the things that struck me as, as different to what I was used to in, in the Arab world. So for a start, now this is, this is the inside of a mosque in Tehran next door to the bazaar. And uh, I'll never forget what our wonderful Iranian guide said to me very early on. He said, we, we in Iran, we never did Islam the way the Arabs wanted us to. <laughs> and that, that sentiment um, rung in my ears many, many times because again and again at the mosques, you, you do not see people praying. There is no, no, no sign of, of open religious piety except amongst the, the clerics themselves. But, the massive, overwhelming population um, regards the mosque as somewhere to go and take a little nap, like these, these gentlemen here in the foreground, having their lunch break, basically, in the mosque, it's somewhere cool to go. Um, and so very little praying going on, but lots of sort of, you know, having taking a break, having a rest. And the, the Shia system of, um, of Islam the very little difference in terms of what you would notice. One, one of the obvious um, differences is the way when you pray as a Shia Muslim, you put your head on one of these little tablets. Instead of putting your head directly on the carpet, on the floor, you, you touch with your forehead this clay, the clay of, of Kerbala, the sacred, um, the sacred clay of Ker Kerbala, where, where the, um, the first Shia martyrs um, are, are buried. And uh, the other thing you'll notice in Iran is uh, the restriction about people not being represented in mosques is, is completely absent. So here you have um, Ayatollah Khomeini, the, the architect of the um, Iranian revolution, and um, the current Ayatollah Khamenei, who is now 82, and here they are, sort of like Big Brother, um, watching you in the mosque. And, and again, coming from the Arab world, you would never, ever see this of people, representations of people like this, let alone current leaders in the mosque as part of the fabric 
of the architecture. Shrines, there are shrines everywhere, and the shrines are much more visited um, than the mosques, actually. Um, they, they, they have separate entrances for men and women, very, very strict, and are on top of the, the, um, the dress code where, you know, you are meant to cover yourself, uh, cover your hair. Um, every time you visit a shrine like this, you have to cover yourself yet more, yet another layer. Um, so here we all are shrouded from head to toe um, with uh, an Iranian lady there at the, at the end um, who I've got my, my arm around. Um, everybody incredibly friendly, wanting to show And here we are in the um, in the mosque, uh, in in the bazaar. Uh, again, the sort of this this is much more much more like the Arab world, in that every, everything jumbled up, people walking side by side, everywhere. And my screen is now refusing to move on for some reason. Now, why is that? Shall I stop sharing and... Um... Uh, <clears throat> yes, you could try that uh, and you could try sharing it again. Yes. Um, okay. And in uh, case it doesn't work, uh, Diana, we can then uh, share from our end. Yes, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll stop and start again. Okay, and now in... in uh, this is very like the Arab world and you've got very colorful bras everywhere on full display in the bazaar in, in a most uh, uh, colorful, colorful um, display. And again, the sort of, the kind of relaxed feel you get as you walk around. So, so this is a typical scene. This is actually in Isfahan where everybody's sort of paddling in the, in the open parks, in the pool. Um, Women are smoking hookahs in the in the cafes, um, and at the weekends, the favourite activity is to go camping in the local parks. And this is up in Hamadan now. As we set off from Tehran, we headed up towards um, Kermanshah, the Kurdish areas, and I was astonished to see everybody camping side by side at, uh, because it was the weekend, and so everybody sets up their picnic stalls and uh but it's really cheap by jowl everybody um almost wanting to socialize to turn it into a, a social activity and uh here in in near Kermanshah, this is the first of the unesco world heritage sites that we visited there are, there are actually 24 um in uh, in in iran and uh, so as, as sunita mentioned iran is far too big a country to cover all of them in, in one visit. I mean, you do have to do several visits to get to all of them. But um, this is Targat Bustan, which is the Sasanian um, astonishing carving um, on, in, in, with a sacred lake in front there. The, the Sasanians were the great arch rivals of the Byzantines. Um, very, very impressive um, uh, uh, carvings on the statues. And then as we moved south, um, here we have the tomb of Daniel, uh, the prophet Daniel, as, as in the, the, the lion's den. So you have um, uh, these, uh, and, and here, this is, this is on the doorstep of, of Susa, um, the site of, of Susa, which, is the, um, which was the Achaemenid capital. Uh, and this was, this was destroyed by, by Alexander the Great. And, and what you have here uh, in the background is actually the um, castle built by the French excavators in the 19th century, uh, which is a very impressive um, place to. And here you have the mud bricks that um, are, are still being made today by people um, and the, to, to show how um, in the restoration of the site, um, they're using the old methods and the craftsmanship 
they're trying to keep the crafts alive. So um, in, in Susa, there was a, a workshop, a pottery workshop uh, with uh, local women making souvenirs out of uh, the local clay. And then uh, this is, uh, this is um, another Sasanian uh, site that's called Shushtar, which is a, um, an extraordinary um, hydraulic system. Uh, so this is, uh, it has a sort of system of, of 13 dams and canals and tunnels. Uh, it's a very, very complex irrigation system. Very, very impressive. I've never seen anything like that in the Arab world. And then we moved on to Shiraz, where you have the, um, the tomb of Hafiz, the favorite um, Iranian poet from the 14th century, who is very much revered. There's a, a saying that there are two books in every Iranian household. Um, one is Hafiz and the other is the Quran, and one is read and one is not. And of course, it's Hafiz that is read. And here is his tomb in alabaster, which everybody touches and strokes in, with great reverence. And then at night, it becomes a, a scene of uh, where people stand and declaim the poetry um, and really enjoy themselves. We then moved on to Persepolis, where um, this is the great symbol of Persepolis, Persepolis the, the Huma bird, the mythical griffin type bird, um, who is on the pillars on, on many of the sites in Persepolis. Persepolis being the great sort of ceremonial capital of the Achaemenids, that was also um, sacked by Alexander when he came in, in 330 BC. And in Persepolis, again, this is a very typical dress, by the way, of, of what a lot of Iranian women wear, you know, sort of slinky, uh, slinky tops and clinging uh, leggings, and they have their head, head scarf right at the back of their head. I mean, it's, uh, it's very much a sort of token, token compliance. But look at the beauty of the, of the sculpture there in, in, in the background, absolutely stunning scenes of, uh, of ceremonial processions. We then moved on to Isfahan, where, um, it, which was the main Safavid capital. So, so now we're, we're in with the, the arch rivals of the Ottomans. So they, they came, Shah Abbas uh, came to power around 1501. And here is the beautiful Safavid bridge in, in, a, in Isfahan. And this is the coach uh, that you can, um, a horse and, and, and cart that you can have a ride round the main square. Uh, here, this is one of the largest squares in the world, where the, um, the coach and horses take you around with fountains and, and um, pools everywhere, and stunning tile work. The Iranian tile work is always very, very colourful, intensely colourful. The mosques themselves, far more colour than you get in, in the Arab world. I mean, this is a characteristic of, of Shia Islam, the, the brightness of the colours everywhere. Very, very striking. And this is one of the hotels where we actually stayed in Isfahan. I mean, the standard of the hotels is, is really very good. Of course, you're not going to get served alcohol everywhere. Um, but um, you, uh, the, the quality of the food is, is very, very good. And we tended to picnic um, during the day or have, have simple lunches in, in local, in local restaurants um, all the food was always excellent and we never suffered any any ill effects and uh, and then towards the end of the trip we got to uh, we passed the sacred um, tree of Zoroaster it's called it's thought to be the oldest tree in in Iran 400 years old full of uh, birds and 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 wildlife and it's on the way to the um, the sacred fire temple at Yazd and this is the only functioning fire temple, Zoroastrian fire temple left in Iran with the symbol, the Zoroastrian symbol there above the top, the um, Ahura Mazda, the, the, the god who was um, represented there in, in, in the spread, spread eagle um, symbol. And uh, you are allowed to go inside and actually see the flames um, that are never allowed to go out. And, and then you can also in Yaz go up onto one of the Towers of Silence. And um, they are, uh, 
very, very striking, of course, because uh, in Zoroastrian religion, you're not allowed to bury or cremate the dead. You have to um, hang the bodies up to be um, uh, have the carcasses picked by birds. <laughs> And so this is where they hung them. And, and um, a lot of us actually felt this is one of our favorite, favorite sites um, in, in the whole trip. And this is the way we traveled around in, in a small mini bus, very, very comfortable. Um, and uh, I have to say that the, gui the guides were excellent throughout and we had um, an extremely good time. And now just to finish off, uh, just to show you a couple of um, exhibits from the Epic Iran exhibition, which is currently at uh, the V&A, well worth a visit. You, you just have to book online. Usually you can get a, um, a ticket, you know, book it about three weeks in advance, something like that. So you do have to plan it and stick to your timing. And it is uh, um, very impressive. I mean, very ambitious. It, it, it does the entire sweep of Iranian history from, from the very beginning right up to now. And so it is um, an astonishingly um, ambitious uh, exhibition. And it does show you the, the astonishing level of craftsmanship. Uh, none of the exhibits have come from Iran, sadly, that the original intention was that they would, um, but there were political difficulties again. And, and so the Iranians did not send over any, any exhibits. So, so the, the exhibits that you can see there are uh, collected from um, all the other world um, universities. So there are things from the Met and from the Louvre. So it is an exceptional collection of, of items that you can see there. Um, what you're looking at here is, a, is, an, is an Iranian horoscope, actually. It's, um, it's a, a 10th century uh, horoscope from the Book of Constellations amazingly detailed um, you can see the the symbols of the zodiac there round in the circle very very detailed and then here's another example of the the, the gold workmanship there are lots there's a lot of jewelry on display and very impressive detailed working of gold so that's it sunita um, over to you and i'm happy to answer any any questions that anybody has Thank you so much, Diana. That was a good overview of the country. And um, as you, I, and like, you know, anybody who's visited there would know that there is, that if we really do start off about the monuments and things, it could go on endlessly, really. There's so much to talk about. And the important thing is to cover, as you did, about what the country offers and what it is all about. And thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. And, uh, and, and as you rightly pointed out, even like, you know, these political situations, I think, um, yeah, the it's it's kind of happening like you know this thing happening around the world today, and even like you know saying uh, the, the people are not uh, countries are not recognizing AstraZeneca and also I think there will be a time when you know people will want to move beyond this and look beyond this. So we can always hope for the best, and uh, regardless of you know even the current president elect and what he does, it's it's just a matter of time before things open up and people look beyond that to travel because definitely it's a country which merits much more than that. And uh, like, you know, it has been in the news off and on uh, so many times and due to various reasons and mostly negative reasons, but uh, it has had its share of people travel. So yeah, we definitely look forward to better times ahead. And now it's time for me to do the screen share. So, oh God, let me, let me bring that up. So uh, yes, I mean it's good that the exhibition is is you know has gone ahead because of course it was it was um, postponed from last year. It was meant to happen last year, but um, because of um, COVID and because of other problems, they they had to delay it by um, by by a year. So I was actually genuinely surprised to see that it was going ahead, and and good for them. You know they they managed to draw it together. And it is, it's quite a big exhibition. So, it, um, you know, in terms of giving you a flavor of the full history, um, uh, you know, it really, it really does give you a, a good sense of that. Um, what it doesn't give you a sense of is what it's like to be in the country, which is, what, which is why I wanted to focus in my presentation more on, on that, on what it feels like to actually be in the country. 
That's true. And that's so important because like, you know, the pictures actually show and with your own experience of having traveled there as to what it is really like, because you read what you read is something entirely different. You know, it portrays a lot more restrictions than it is, uh, than uh, that is there. And um, yeah, so that was, that was really good to know that the part behind the behind the scenes thing. Mm. And uh, now going on to the tours that we offer uh, to the country. So uh, there are quite a few. We offer five different types of group trips and then a whole lot of whole range of uh, private tours. And uh, there's very little overlap between these trips because there are many for second or, or multi timers into the country. But a good introductory trip for a first timer would be classical Iran, one of our most popular tours and uh, it discovers the history, the culture, and modern day Iran. We run two trips uh, during um, spring as well as autumn time. Normally the trips go out in uh, mid-April, but we um, next year you will see most of the dates are from May because we will be um, running them post Ramadan. So the Ramadan period can be a little restrictive. Uh, so we to operate them after that. And all these trips can also be done as private tours. Glories of Persia, which is quite similar to classical Iran, it has most of the same places, uh, but it's more archaeological and history heavy. So for those who want to go more in depth into the archaeology and history, and again we find similar dates in uh, autumn as well as uh, spring, and also this can be offered as a private tour at any time of the year. Though we would recommend, um, you know, kind of uh, not traveling during the summer months and the peak winter months, where they have extreme climate. Uh, UNESCO sites of Iran, 25 days which uh, in the country. And we've not put the list of places here because there would be just so many. Uh, but again, the, you know, you can do it in the, uh, as well as autumn time and as a private trip at any time. Now, here's a list of all the other possible tours. We do have a Silk Road tour, the Silk Road through Persia trip, which the dates of which uh, work very well um, to run back to back with either Silk Road through Turkey or Silk Road through the stands. So should you want to combine and do a longer Silk Road journey, you can actually do that. Um, Iran can be well combined with Armenia because it's uh, possible to travel overland across the border. And then for private trips, there can be very specific ones based around the culinary uh, things or uh, hiking, skiing, which is quite popular in Iran, deserts, you know, nomadic life, birding, literature, you name it, and there's something for everyone with different interests. Uh, going through the, yeah, some useful information for Iran, so it's uh, four and a half hours ahead of GMT, and uh, no direct flights. Uh, Air Iran used to fly, but then, you know, they are not so popular. It's uh, always been Turkish Airlines, which has been most popular, or you can fly through uh, using the Middle Eastern carriers like uh, Qatar Airways. Um, Pre-departure visa. Now that's very important for three nationalities, UK, US and Canada. All other nationalities can get a visa on arrival, but for these three, um, you need to have a pre-authorization and then you need to get a visa before you travel. Now we provide assistance for the authorization. It can take up to 45 to 60 working days. Um, and uh, so we send you the list of the documents we require from you. Once we get the authorization, you need to either go personally to the consulate or uh, depending on the country you are in, you can actually post the documents to the consulate along with the payment and then the visa is granted, stamped on your passport and returned to you. Uh, even for those who can't get a visa on arrival, once they book, um, as an additional service, we just provide them an authorization so that it's easier once they arrive at the airport, uh, the whole visa process. And there is no additional charge for the authorization. Currency. The currency is called the real, and soon it will be replaced by the tuman. Um, we always recommend carrying cash into Iran because uh, credit cards are hardly accepted, except for some carpet factories and all that. Those are not uh, accepted. Um, ATMs are only for the local people. They only accept local cards. So no foreign cards are accepted. So ATMs are out. And um, even, um, what do you call it? Um, so no other form of currency. Cash is the best uh, form. And uh, and a little briefcase along with you, because say one pound gets you about 100,000 rials. So if you change 100 to 100 pounds, um, you'll have a briefcase load of money. Of can, I, can, I just, can I just say, Sunita, on that topic, actually, because, uh, you know, as you say, one's told the credit cards don't work. So you have to have your cash and things. So uh, in Isfahan, uh, in a carpet shop, you know, um, I was 
being shown all these carpets. And, uh, and I said to the chap, well, don't, you know, yes, you can show me all you like, but I can't buy any of them anyway, because I haven't got, I haven't got enough money and you don't take credit cards. And this was just an ordinary shop in the bazaar. And he said, oh, no, don't worry. We, we'll take credit cards. I'll just ring up my friend in Dubai and we'll, we'll post the card that way. <laughs> this, is, this, is one of, this is one of the examples of how, um, you know, the system appears to be impenetrable and very forbidding almost and, and make you feel, oh, God, you know, if it's really that much hassle, I don't want to go. But, but the, the reality when, when you're there is that it's not at all like that. Everybody is incredibly friendly and compliant. And, you know, um, as I said, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of delighted that, you, that you're there anyway, that the hostility is purely at government level. And, uh, uh, and I was staggered. And, and I'm so glad I bought that carpet in Isfahan because it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's now in my hall and it gives me um, enormous pleasure every time I walk across it. And, and it's thanks to uh, <laughs> a bit of sanctions busting that goes on all the time in all Iranian bazaars. <laughs> Sanctions, <laughs> believe me, can be got round very, very easily if you've got friends in Dubai. <laughs> Absolutely, and that's what I noticed. At the carpet shops, yes, they make it easier, but um, but they, uh, other places, yeah, I mean, it's always handy to have that cash. And uh, initially you wondered, oh my God, with all this currency and like, you know, so much of it, but it's just so safe. Nobody turns around and looks at you taking out those wads of cash or like, you know, spending it. So yeah, you feel absolutely safe. And I love the millionaire feeling there, <laughs> holding all that cash in my hand. Um, dress code, um, as you've seen in Diana's pictures also, like uh, no shorts, but sandals are okay for males and females and females must cover their heads in public. Best time to travel is, as I said, spring or autumn. Just, just on that, sorry, Sunita, just on that, on the dress code thing, um, I didn't mention actually that I, I travelled with my daughter on this occasion. Um, so she's actually in some of the photos. And um, she, uh, she was concerned about the dress code and all this having to cover up. But, but in practice, again, you know, you don't have to take it that seriously. <laughs> it's, it's when you pass a checkpoint, um, then the driver used to call out, OK, put your headscarf on now. We're coming to the checkpoint, you know. <laughs> so everybody sort of got their checkpoint, got, got their scarf out and covered it up for the benefit of the checkpoint. And then after the checkpoint, that's it. Everyone takes it off again, you know. It's a, so it, it's a sort of a form of compliance, really. But, but the reality is, is, is quite different on the ground. Very true. Very true. It's much more relaxed than it's made out to be. So yes, much more relaxed. That was yes. that was a good thing to see. And uh, yeah. Um, so right, it's time for um, question answers then. Um, so let's. Um, I'll just read out the questions to you. Uh, the first one actually is uh, more TTU related. Uh, there's a question about if we are organizing any trips to Iran at the moment. Well, currently the borders are closed. So no trips are possible, but uh, we are hoping in the next few months, we are hoping for the borders to open. And uh, for UK, US and Canadian citizens, I would recommend looking at anything only for next year because of the amount of time it's going to take to organize the visas. But um, other nationalities who can get it on arrival, maybe we'll see it on a case to case basis once the borders open up and one, you know, whenever they do open up, uh, we will see how it is then. Uh, and then we have, um, could you tell us something about, um, uh, Diana, about uh, which currency is preferred by the Iranians in the bazaars? Do they prefer pounds, dollars, euros? Um, do you know, I, I, I think it was just the, the we, we traveled with the local currency. That, that's, what, um, that's what we traveled with. It, we, we ha you have to change it in cash. So you arrive with a wadge of dollars, say, and you go to the, um, the money changer, you know, there are money changing booths all over the place. Um, and you get the local currency. That's what you use in the local shops and in the bazaars. Right, yeah. They did seem keen, you know, at some places they wanted to see what the currency is like or like, you know, uh, just for the sake of some some places, I think they just are happy to accept or take just for the sake of having the currency with them. So mm. uh, euros, pounds, dollars. I mean, they were open to well, any currency. To in, in, yeah, in my experience, it's always dollars to prefer, not not euros, um, and certainly not sterling. 
<laughs> nobody, nobody knows what sterling is, you know. I mean, it, in dollars, everyone knows what it is. Everybody, everybody oh, trusts exactly. the dollar. That, that's the irony of it, isn't it? You know, politically, yeah, they, you know, you know, when I uh, traveled at that time, they seem to be, uh, I think, you know, things have been changing. <laughs> since then so uh, they were also wanting to sell us um, these uh, uh, saffron and all in euros and so yeah it was interesting to see you know I think they kind of are open to it all now um, there's a question about like you know if you don't cover your heads what happens um, well what 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 you observe especially amongst younger women is that they they kind of let it fall um, back you know to the back of the head so, so that it's it's sort of a token thing you know so you've got it there um but but it, it's very noticeable that um it's slipping slipping more and more and and you know i mean women will sit in groups eating um you know in in a in a sort of pavement cafe or something um and they'll pretty much just have their headscarf round round on their shoulders you know, and, and, and nobody's really that bothered. Uh, you know, it, it's not that somebody's rushing around ticking you off the whole time. It's, it's not like that. Obviously, if you're going to, I'm mean, talking about the cities, you know, where these things are much looser. Uh, I'm sure in some of the smaller traditional villages and things, uh, obviously, it would be very different. And then you, you, you know that you'd sense that immediately. And you, you know, you'd see that everybody else was very strictly covered. And so you would, you would also cover your head. I'm, I'm talking about you know, as, as a visitor, what you tend to do is follow what you see around you in, in the local women. And so if the local women are behaving, you know, that they're very relaxed about it all, then, then it means you can behave like that too. But um, if you're going to a very much more conservative, you know, small village somewhere, then, and you see that everybody is carefully covered up, then you will do the same. You just take your cue from local people. Exactly. That's correct. Yeah. And what would you say about like, you know, places to the west of Iran, like Hamadan and the west of Iran? Um, yes, well, we, I mean, on the trip that I did with, with, with you, um, we, we did travel all that area. And I, I have to say that scenically that I found that to be the most beautiful part of the country with the mountains, um, you know, and rivers. Uh, Kermanshar, I found very beautiful indeed. Uh, that, that bit of, um, you know, up against the Iraqi border there, the Kurdish areas, I found those to be um, very, very striking indeed. Brilliant. And what would you say, um, what do you think the country, uh, how is it for solo female travelers? Well, it's, as I said, it's actually one of the safest countries to travel in because, um, you know, there is no there is no physical violence of, of that sort, you know, there, there's no war going on, but, but also there is no kind of, you know, there's no, there's no drunkenness, obviously. Um, there's no sort of grievous bodily harm. All of, all of that sort of um, travel is, is meant to be very straightforward. I mean, obviously I was traveling around in a group, which is, which is not, you know, how I would normally travel. When I travel in the Arab world, I travel, you know, um, uh, you know, independently so um but but my my feeling is that it's probably extremely safe as, as a solo woman traveler um although certainly as a british person i think you have to go with a guide and uh, certainly that was the case back in 2014 i think it's very difficult to 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 get a visa unless you're going with a guide i, I don't think as a british person it's possible to get a visa for independent travel it may be for other nationalities, you know, Irish, for example, I think can probably do it. Yeah. Yes, that's still the case. And um, uh, UK, US and Canadians, you know, they can't be, they can't go around without a guide. And uh, that's one of the conditions for getting the authorization for the visa also. So that's mm -hmm. correct, yes. And um, what, is, um, what is the food like, different regions? And uh, is there much for vegetarians? Ah, well, actually, my daughter is a vegetarian and she struggled, I have to say. It, it, that's not great for vegetarians. <laughs> it's not like the Arab world where you've got huge range of meza. Um, uh, and so, in fact, they seem to find the idea of not eating meat rather peculiar and, and were not, uh, uh, not, 
not that sympathetic to it actually. Uh, so so uh, she she did she did struggle. Um, people say that the best Iranian food is cooked at home, not in restaurants, and and so I'm sure that I'm sure that is the case. Uh, but having said that, I mean, it was very varied. I mean, it's all local produce, obviously. A lot of, lot of things like pomegranate and walnut in the, um, in, in the sort of flavorings. Um, actually, one of the things that was very, very novel that I hadn't come across anywhere else is a huge selection of, of fruit beers. <laughs> so you get pomegranate beer, you get um, uh, pear, beer, you know, you get tropical fruits beer. I mean, every, every flavor you could think of, you can get it in, 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 in a sort of completely alcohol-free beer. <laughs> That's true. Those fruit beers were very, very popular. And, <laughs> and Doug, of course, which is uh, buttermilk. So yes. for those who don't want to go for the beer part of it. So. Yes, yes. And uh, how easy is it communicating with the locals? Um, yes, I mean, the, the language uh, side of things, it's interesting. I, I found, and obviously traveling with a group, it, it's harder to, you know, to sort of, to get, uh, you know, you're having fewer conversations one-to-one -one with people, although it's perfectly possible if you, if you, you, know, you can go up and start conversations with, with anybody and people will come up and start conversations with you. The older generation do not speak much uh, much English was was my was my experience. Um, the, you know, it's 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 young people who um, who uh, you know in uh, are, are obviously very very uh, wanting to to practice their their English. Um, so it's a yes, you communicating with the older generation is something uh, that that's harder. But then, of course, you know, you you have um, you have a guide with you, and um, I have to say that our guide was absolutely excellent. And I and um, you know, I think Travel the Unknown do pride themselves on getting the best guides, and and you can learn so much from a guide, and and he can be your interpreter too. So if there is somebody you particularly want to talk to, and they can't speak in English, then the guide will always help you out. Exactly. That's one thing, yes. I mean, we are very fortunate to have a great team there and uh, guides who are so, uh, like, you know, passionate about their country, very knowledgeable. And uh, we had one who who had these, uh, you know, kind of poetry books. And every morning when we sat on the bus, we were supposed to recite one and then he would kind of, you know, explain what it meant. Um, so that was absolutely amazing. And it's interesting to see how much they are into their literature. They take pride in that. And um, of course, you went on a much longer trip, uh, Diana, than I did. And did you come across any interesting wildlife in the country? Um... I can't say that I did actually. I mean, I saw some interesting birds of prey, <laughs> um, but uh, I can't think of any. I mean, any sort of larger wildlife that that we saw. I mean, there are lizards and lizards and birds. I would say is mainly what what what, what we saw. Um, yeah, but you know, we didn't we didn't get. We weren't sort of in, I think you'd have to be in the forests, in the mountains, in, in a different sort of way to how we were in order to see that, that kind of wildlife. <laughs> I think it's, it's more the birds and um, what you get to see there, um, because uh, a lot of it is desert. So either you get to see those desert animals, but when you actually go in there or uh, birds definitely. Yes, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there are you know, wolves and possibly even bears and things, but, but, but you have to go to the pretty remote mountainous forested areas to see to the northern there. parts um, of the country yes yes um, and an interesting thing that we used to find there is people with the plasters on their nose and apparently yes. it was you know the first time I saw one or another one like you know I thought they had hurt themselves yes. and then the guide explained that they had all done a nose job and uh, like, yes that's right the capital of the nose job that's right so, yes people people I mean it, it is a form of tourism actually that, that other other you know, for, for, for people who, who, who can travel to Iran easily, <laughs> it's a destination of choice to go and have your nose job. Yes, the, the plastic <laughs> surgeons are meant to be excellent. In Shiraz, especially, I was very struck by the numbers of women walking around with their, with their plaster across their nose. <laughs> True. 
<laughs> well, if I had more time, I would have come back with the goals, I guess. <laughs> so thank you so much. And that's all the questions. So as we move on to the next slide, um, this is what our next event is going to be. We will stay in the region and we will visit yet another ancient civilization, Egypt. And um, so that's all for today. But thank you so much, Diana, for a very insightful and interesting trip of Iran. And uh, thank you all once again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Khuda Hafiz.